Well, this is a lot funner for me than the last one. Humanity and divinity combined. It should be a stimulating hope. Man on his own can accomplish nothing. Man cooperating with God can experience a changed heart. God always intended the closest connection between himself and the creatures he made in his image. Humans are not left dangling, helpless and hopeless, on the battlefield between Christ and Satan. Humans are not intended to be the recipients of infinite get-out-of-jail-free cards. Humans will never enter heaven because they claim a loose verbal affiliation with Jesus. My thesis today is very simple. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. Divinity works in the human believer. God has a part, man has a part, and man may become a partaker of the divine nature. That's what I believe. Now again, this uh, presentation, we have a handout for you. It's uh, available again on greatcontroversy.org, and if you go into the panel, uh, the left panel, and go down to where it says resources, and click on that, and then go in and look for God's character in the final generation, and click on that, you'll find all the resources here. And what we have as a resource for you is just simply, you may already have it on your phone, uh, we have just a selection from First Selected Messages, page 340 to 344. There are 18 paragraphs in this Ellen White document, and uh, um, we're going to talk about that in a few moments. But first, I'd like you to open your Bible to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we have three parts kind of to this today. We're going to talk, uh, look at Philippians 2. Then we're going to look at this corrupt channel statement in Ellen White. Uh, and then we're going to go and finally look at the partakers of the divine nature statement in Second Peter. So if you look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, 12 and 13. You know the, the chapter there. Let's look at those two verses, 12 and 13 of Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. It's a very interesting passage, and it's one that we might talk about it in passing, but we often don't stay too long in this place. Fear and trembling and those, those things. Now we know Philippians 2, the fifth verse urges the believer what? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When you look at Philippians 2, when you take from verse 5 and look at verses 6 through 11, if you're open to that, you see that Jesus is presented as the, presented as the ultimate example of divinity humbling himself to humanity, victorious in humanity, and restored at last on high. And finally, verses 12 and 13 show the combination of human and divine work. Now, we know Philippians, this is a message from, from Paul to the church of the Philippians. And in light of Jesus humbling himself, Philippians 2, being, then being exalted, the believers admonished in verse 12, work out your own salvation, for that is God's plan. You know that it says that he is to fear and tremble? How many churches in the Sacramento area do you drive by and there's a a church has its sign, and it says there, join us for worship. It's time to fear and tremble. I'm guessing not very many. But the Bible tells us that if we want to experience the salvation that Jesus has for us, we are to fear and tremble. It's part of the plan. Salvation is only possible because uh, the human's activity is conduct conducted in league with God. He cooperates with God. The believer cooperates with God. It is God who works in him. God wills and God does in him according to God's pleasure. Now, securing our salvation, I 
don't want to use this word very often. It's so overused, and yet I believe it fits here. Securing our salvation is an extreme project. It's an extreme project God has taken on. The thought even that God could take a fallen human who has developed a self-serving character in deranged humanity, that God would respect the free choice of that person, that God would then persuade him to abandon his chosen selfishness and then transform him so that he embraces life with the Holy Spirit indwelling him, that is a remarkable project. That is an extreme project. But it's really no more remarkable nor extreme than the New Testament command in Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, the willing and the doing are not man's work. The human part is to cooperate, to permit God to accomplish that which God only can accomplish. Inspired writings highlight this cooperative element. You know the texts. Jesus says in John 15, 15, without me, you can do nothing. And yet in Philippians 4, verse 13, we find that the believer rejoices that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we look right at it, but we don't really see it. We don't really see the power of the gospel that God has for us. God works so we can work. Not so many centuries ago, a man named John Wesley said, No man sins because he has not grace, but because he does not use the grace he has. And John Wesley was right. That's right of people then, and it's right of people today, and it's right of you and me today. God forbid on the day that we sin. It's not because of God's fault. Why would I have become a Christian if that was my case? If it was really true that you could do nothing, it would mean that you didn't have faith, but Romans 12, 12 13 says to us, 12, 3 says that God has given to each man the measure of faith. And when you became a Christian, why did you do it? Did you become a Christian on this basis that that if someone told you, what if someone had told you then, now that I better understand the sin problem, now that I understand that the best experience, the best experience I can hope for for the rest of my life is the same bondage as before, and that Jesus came only to save his people from their sins at some later time, maybe hundreds or even thousands of years from now, what use would that be to me? See, I need help now. I need to overcome now. I'm desperate now. And that's just where others are. They look for a living Savior. They look for a living God. And they look for a remedy from him now. And if we don't preach the gospel right, we will not be giving them a remedy for now. Jesus is the great physician. There is a remedy God's word shows us how in the present experience, how in the present to experience victory. God must work in me. Friends, there is no other way. You're not going to do it on your own. In Philippians 12 and 13, Paul reminds the beloved disciples in Philippi how diligent they've been in serving God. They are to work out their own salvation. They are to be engaged with divinity. This is life or death work. And yet they're not alone as they submit to him. He works in them. His will, his desire for good for them is operating and victories are made real in their experience in the power of God. Christianity is not a fake or a pretend or a make-believe religion that uh, we just kind of hope there's a victory someday and call it a day. Christianity is a present walk with the living God. And without him, we have nothing, but with him, we have so much. Now, in my previous presentation, we noticed that uh, I might have mentioned that in passing that uh, in this book, God's character in the last generation, 
that uh, there's a statement from Ellen White, and we often call it the corrupt channels statement. It's interesting that in this book, half of the authors, half of the authors refer to this statement when they basically teach that you cannot overcome today. And so what I want to do is take the middle part of this presentation and uh, I want to look at that with you because you know what's interesting? Although half of the theologians and scholars that wrote this book quote that and refer to that, and you know what's interesting? That not one even does even a cursory analysis, even a cursory look at the, at the Ellen White document or the statement. So if you don't mind, today what my plan is is we're going to look a little bit at it and maybe start some of that analysis that didn't get done when that book was written. And you know what I always find with Ellen White is that when you start plowing into it and studying, I begin to come to hope. I see the plan of God for me, and I begin to see that Jesus does love me and he's giving me the insight I need. So let's look a little bit at this issue. So now the statement we have that's referred to is from First Selected Messages, page 344, and we call it the Corrupt Channel Statement. Here, is, uh, here it is, uh, just sliced out here. Here's what it is. The religious services, the prayers, the praise, the penitent confession of sin ascend from true believers as, as incense to the heavenly sanctuary, but passing through the corrupt channels of humanity, they are so defiled that unless purified by blood, they can never be of value with God. They ascend not in spotless purity, and unless the intercessor, who is at God's right hand, presents and purifies all by his righteousness, it is not acceptable to God. Now, in God's character in the last generation, uh, this is what we're told in this book. Here's some of the things uh, we find on page 262, 63, 64, and 266, all right? Even our very best is tainted by sin. Here's another one. The truly tragic person is the good person who finds it hard to acknowledge that even good deeds need forgiveness because of what Ellen White terms our corrupt channels of humanity. Here's another one. We need to understand that we are not just those who commit a little error here and a minor mistake there. No, all of us are fully embedded. All of us are fully embedded in a world of ungodliness. She goes on to say, every person is embedded and entangled in the deadly condition of sin. Sin is the universal human condition. Nor is, and it goes on, nor is the, second, the great second coming dependent upon our perfection or we would never be saved because there is no such thing as human righteousness. And there's others. This is just a sample from one of the chapters. Now I want to ask you a question. How can the believer be fully embedded fully embedded, and yet our Lord in John 17, 14 can boldly say, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And in John 14, go over to verse 16, and Jesus said this, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Well, we just heard they were embedded hopelessly in this wor uh, world of sin. Jesus says they are not of the world. And in John, 14, John 17, 17, he asks his father, sanctify them by your truth. Now, if they cannot be, what if they cannot be sanctified? If even truth won't do it, what's going to do it? How can you be sanctified if, if even the truth won't sanctify you? And so here's a fact None of, the auth none of the authors in the book here offers even a rudimentary discussion of this passage. They, they throw it there. They, they quote, quote it there. And so if, if even believers are fully embedded in a world of ungodliness and if it's all hopeless, I don't really know what message we have for the world. It's interesting that this document, and you have that would be the handout I think you've received, uh, this handout. This handout here is the whole document, and when you go through the whole document, you find a lot of joyful, hopeful, and insightful pieces. 
And so I want to look a little bit with you at this statement and do some, some analyzing, at least begin the process that wasn't accomplished, unfortunately, in this, in this book. All right. Well, let's, uh, let me give you some background. There's some phrases that Ellen White uses, and uh, I'm still studying these phrases. I don't claim that I have the last word, but we'll, let's start with these. I won't give you all the references. They're in your page. But um, she uses different phrases, so let's look at this. An analysis of Ellen White's writing shows that her references to, quote, the natural heart, unquote, Show that, it, show that it is initially neither totally evil nor totally righteous. The natural heart isn't neutral either. It trends downward. In Ellen White's writings, the natural heart and the carnal mind are equivalent terms. If you study this, you, I believe you'd come to that conclusion as well. The natural heart must be daily converted. It must be continuously subdued. It is a persistent feature of the human experience. So these are just con conclusions I've arrived at looking at Ellen White's use of these terms. You may want to look these up and study them for yourselves. Uh, a few more things here. God gives the believer a new nature. There is power in the divine nature to withstand evil, and God's grace subdues the natural heart. Desire of Ages 678 is one of those. Life of Paul 125. Jesus works in the natural heart to arouse enmity against sin, and through exercising faith in God, enmity against sin and Satan is created in the heart. Okay, human effort is necessary to overcome the tendencies of the natural heart. There has to be some human effort. Another phrase Ellen White uses in this document, and you can kind of scan it while we're thinking about it here, she talks about the springs of life. The springs of life. What is that? Well, in Signs of the Times, March 8, 1899, Ellen White says that the springs of life can be healed. And then you look at Steps to Christ, maybe, page 18. God's power work in, working inside a person can change his heart. And in Selected Messages, the one that you have, uh, page 341, it says that through Christ, the springs of life can vitalize man's nature, transform his tastes, and set his affections flowing toward heaven. Through the union of the divine with the human nature, Christ could enlighten the understanding and infuse his life-giving properties through the soul dead in trespasses and sins. Just some of the things that she says in this really fascinating document. So you see, God has to get into the heart. The work must be accomplished from within. Humans have no power or goodness of their own. God has given us faculties, and certain capacities are designed into us. Yet, through the effects of sin, these have been, they're described in different ways. They're described as palsied, blunted. Some of them are even described as having been deadened. Faculties that are built into you that are palsied, blunted, or deadened because of the fallen uh, humanity we have. Well, it's interesting that another thing she says in, uh, that you'll have on your handout, uh, page 340, all the ingenious subterfuges the devil can suggest are presented to his mind, to man's mind, to prevent every good impulse, unquote. So that's an interesting item because, you see, something important is still functioning in the fallen human nature. The devil acts intentionally to suppress impulses toward the good in us however dim they might be. God calls forth these impulses which make at least limited human response possible. Remember Steps to Christ, 47, the power of choice God has given to men. It's, a, it's built in. It's something you have, the power to choose. The natural heart then, as spoken of in First Selected Messages 340, is that I would say it is that baseline humanity that we all are born with, and, and it includes the character we develop on top of that humanity. That character trends downward to self-service, and the only way back from this is for divinity and humanity to be combined. I want you to hear again the results that occur when humans act out their faith. This is from Signs of the Times, March 8, 1899. Now listen to this. It's talking about Jesus. When he came to the world the first time, Divinity and humanity were blended. This is our only hope. 
The Son of Man is fully qualified to be the originator of a humanity that will blend with divinity by partaking of the divine nature. He offers to make us golden threads in the web of humanity. He would have us act our part by cooperating with him in healing the springs of life which have been perverted and setting them flowing in sanctified channels. That's a pretty interesting line, isn't it? Healing the springs of life. Throughout our life, we retain the natural heart. It must be daily subdued. But as day by day we join in fellowship with God, as we consent to his working, we train ourselves to cooperate with divinity. We receive God's grace, we invite his Holy Spirit inside. Not power innate to us, but power external to us enables us to cooperate. This is the gospel lived out. This is the hope of the Christian experience. Jesus, it says in 340.3 on your handout, Jesus took the human form and nature. Now that's an interesting uh, thing that he did that. He took that to show the way. See, he didn't wear our humanity like a costume. He took a humanity like our own, and just as we need the Holy Spirit, he needed the continuous influence of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus walked through his, this world, and he overcame. Jesus' life-giving properties are transmitted moment by moment to the receptive believer. There is an actual change in the person. 341.3, it says there again, Christ on the cross not only draws men to repentance toward God for the transgression of his law, for whom God pardons, he first makes penitent. You know, penitent, being made sorry. God's drawing us and making us penitent. I want you to know those are not forensic actions. That's not just counted. You're not just counted as being sorry. God first makes you sorry. You're not just, just uh, counted as repenting, but God gives you the gift of repentance. Repentance is a gift. God is ready to give us a gift of repentance. In fact, we go on and read in 342, uh, paragraph 2, all that it was possible for man to endure in the conflict with Satan, Christ endured in his human and divine nature combined. Obedient, sinless to the last, he died for man, his substitute and surety, enduring all that men ever endure from the, from the deceiving tempter that men may overcome by being a partaker of the divine nature. And I have decided this is what I want to experience. I want to be a partaker of the divine nature. I'm already a partaker of the human nature, the, the, the messed up human nature, and I am very sure that being a partaker of the divine nature is a lot better. And so I need the help of God. Jesus endured, according to this text that we just read, Jesus endured the maximum that we endure. The maximum. Can't do more than, than, than that. His example of endurance is exactly the, applicable to your own case. His example of overcoming is exactly applicable to your own case. 342.4. The righteousness of Christ is presented as a free gift to the sinner if he will accept it. Will you accept it? The righteousness of Christ, it's a free gift to you. Will you accept it? The sinner, it says here, same uh, paragraph, four, has nothing of his own, but what is tainted and corrupted, polluted with sin, utterly repulsive to appear in holy God. Only through the righteous character of Christ can man come near to God. See, by choosing to sin, man's works were made valueless. Jesus never chose to sin. Jesus is God. His works are meritorious. It's by his works that we're saved. It's not by our works. Now, as we continue reading through this document, you look at 344, paragraph 1. There's two that intercede for us. It says, Christ, our mediator, and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding in man's behalf. Now it goes on and says, it says of Christ, quote, he presents his blood shed from the foundation of the world. So that's what Jesus does. 
His spotless character stands in the place of our spotted character. His merits save us in a judicial sense. But, now listen to this quote, the Spirit works upon our hearts. This is what the Spirit does. Jesus does that. Here's what the Spirit does now. The Spirit works upon our hearts, drawing out prayers and penitence, praise and thanksgiving. The gratitude which flows from our lips is the result of the Spirit's striking the chords of the soul in holy memories, awakening the music of the heart. And that is a precious thought. Did you hear the action language there? The Holy Spirit strikes the chords of the soul. He draws out. He awakens. None of this is forensic or accounted, is it? This isn't forensic. This is the real deal, so to speak, right? At the same time, none of it's meritorious here. Jesus' death on the cross, that solves that for us. Calvary, when Jesus dies on Calvary, he provided the meritorious component. But divinity and humanity must be combined. The heart is to be transformed. Great controversy, 506. It is the grace that Christ implants in the soul which creates in man enmity against Satan. Without this converting grace and renewing power, man would continue the captive of Satan, a servant ever ready to do his bidding. But the new principle in the soul creates conflict where hitherto had been peace. The power which Christ imparts enables man to resist the tyrant and usurper. Some people are worried about handing out great controversies. Friends, when I was becoming a Christian and becoming a Seventh-day Adventist, the Great Controversy was the first book that I read. And when I read this, I said, this is God speaking to my heart. This is what I need. 508 of Great Controversy. In the unregenerate heart, there is love for sin and a disposition to cherish and excuse it. In the renewed heart, there is hatred for sin and determined resistance against it. Determine resistance. And sometimes we have a hatred for sin, but it's not a thorough hatred. Sometimes we have a, a resistance against sin, but sometimes we are not having the determined resistance. I want the renewed heart. I want the Holy Spirit to be in my heart so that in my life, it's the experience I have is determined resistance. God must implant grace. Implanted grace creates enmity. This is converting grace, renewing power, power imparted. See, God changes the, belief, the believer. So as we're reading in this, uh, we're, we're noticing in Ellen White's statement, she's got a lot of interesting things, and we look at the Bible and we find them too. We do have two intercessors, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 26 and 27, Hebrews 7, 25. And we have one mediator, Galatians 3, 19. There's several texts we could look up for that. Their work is to restore us. Jesus, as mediator, comes between and he reconciles us. He secured the gift of the Holy Spirit for us, who intercedes for us and who who, can we say it? He repairs the image of God in humanity. We should not lose sight of God's goal. God's goal is that humani humanity and divinity be combined. Quote, the atonement. Sometimes these phrases, the great controversy, the plan of redemption. All these, these kinds of phrases, those are God's description of this process. Common views of the gospel lead us to set our sights too low. God is able, Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. It's the gospel. And it's not just the, the, the wimpy gospel. It's what the Bible has for us. And it's the gospel that the Bible has for the last generation. This is the gospel for you and I who are living in, God forbid, in 2019. So now let's come to this section quoted so many times in the 2018 books. 
Selected Messages, Book 1, and I'm going to just quote from 344, paragraph 2 and 3. I'll read the whole thing, right? The religious services, the prayers, the praise, the penitent confession of sin ascend from true believers as incense to the heavenly sanctuary. But passing through the corrupt channels of humanity, they are so defiled that unless purified by blood, they can never be of value with God. They ascend not in spotless purity. And unless the intercessor who is at God's right hand presents and purifies all by his righteousness, it is not acceptable to God. All incense from earthly tabernacles must be moist with the cleansing drops of the blood of Christ. He holds before the Father the censer of his own merits in which there is no taint of earthly corruption. He gathers into this censer the prayers, the praise, and the confessions of his people. And with these... He puts his own spotless righteousness. Then, perfumed with the merits of Christ's propitiation, the incense comes up before God, holy and entirely acceptable. The gracious answers are returned. Oh, that all may see that everything in obedience, in penitence, in praise and thanksgiving must be placed in the glowing fire of the righteousness of Christ. The fragrance of this righteousness ascends like a cloud, around the mercy seat. I wish that they'd quoted the whole piece and not just that one piece. I'm finding a lot here in the whole document that's quite encouraging, actually. So now, according to the God's character in the last generation statement, somehow, somehow Ellen White's statement that we just read constitutes evidence that that, quote, all are in bondage to the power of sin, quote, there is nothing we can do about our sinful nature, and quote, even our very best is tainted by sin, quote, even our good deeds need forgiveness. Well, what about that? So let me give you six, six uh, quick items in response to that. Number one, none of us have ever suggested or probably even, even had the thought, till we read it in the book, that our deeds might be personally, salvifically meritorious. Christ's deeds alone save. Isn't that settled? I mean, in my Cleansing Clothes book, I've got two whole chapters on that. <laughs> Didn't quote those. All right. Number two. Perfumed with the righteousness of Christ, deeds rise before God, and they, it's the, what it says in the document you have, they are made entirely acceptable. No one who teaches last generation theology, or maybe a better term for it, basic Adventism, nobody is teaching that we ever abandon Christ. Nobody is teaching that we come to a place where we, we, we somehow outrun Jesus. We wouldn't have any righteousness then. We're not teaching that. Number three, those who believe in the original sin idea, they make the idea that the corrupt channels of humanity, they make that idea to represent our humanity, and they say that it is infected with sin. Infected with sin. You know what's interesting with that terminology, infected with sin? I can tell you the fact, none of you have ever read Ellen White and read that we are infected with sin. It's not a phrase she uses. None of you have ever read the Bible and read that we're infected with sin. That is not a Bible language. So what, it's good sometimes to stay close to inspired terminology and watch out for terminology, terminology that's been dreamed up by some of our contemporary theological helpers. Let's stay away from, let's watch out for that and just be careful. Okay, that's number three. Number four. Now, Ellen White describes the how of how humanity becomes corrupted. It's important to understand this. She describes it differently than those who teach original sin or that we're infected with sin. So now here's the quotation. It's from Manuscript 57, 1890. Christ took our nature, fallen but not corrupted, and would not be corrupted unless... He received the words of Satan in the words in place of the words of God. Unquote. Did you hear that? Jesus' humanity was fallen but not corrupted. Now, our nature is fallen and it is corrupted too because guess what? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. At some time, we've received the words of Satan. 
in place of the words of God and acted upon them. Jesus didn't do that. Number five here, true holiness is possible in fallen humanity. That's a pretty bold statement, but let me read it. Let me read you a paragraph and see what you think. This is from Signs of the Times, October 6, 1890. It's a little bit long, but every part of it is, is worth listening to. Here we go. And again, the quote, what I'm saying, true holiness is possible in fallen humanity. Is it true? Listen to this. The affections, perverted by sin, become degenerated and depraved, but through a connection with Christ, they are brought into a higher, holier channel, and aided by divine grace, man may be an overcomer. But it's just starting. Here's the next one. Carrying right on the next sentence. The faculties, warped in a wrong direction through the influence of sin, need no longer be misused and perverted, need no longer be wasted on accomplishing selfish purposes or fastened upon the perishing things of earth. Onward now, the very next sentence. When the soul has been convicted of sin, has accepted of Christ, the character becomes transformed, and there is an elevation and purification of all the powers of the being. They are no longer debased by selfish aims and unholy actions. And then this question is asked, what may not man become through the grace given him of God? Through the sanctification of the truth, he may become a partaker of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. He may show forth an example of righteousness, of true holiness. And so my assertion that true holiness is possible in fallen humanity. Well... Our own works do not become salvifically meritorious, and yet our faculties, although previously warped, in the transformed Christian, they can be rightly used. Even in First Selected Messages 344, Ellen White calls for us to become partakers. Do you read it in 342, paragraph 2? Obedient, sinless to the last, he, that is Jesus, Jesus died for man, his substitute and surety, enduring all that men ever endure from the deceiving tempter, that man may be overcome by being a partaker of the divine nature. There it is. Number six. Do you know the believer forever needs Jesus? Our works are not acceptable to God for salvation, and they never will be. And we're not trying to make our works uh, acceptable to God. That's not our, our business. Jesus has accomplished this. God's forgiveness is forever necessary for sins that we've committed. Can't go back on that. Were his forgiveness ever withdrawn, we would be destroyed. Nevertheless, the believer will draw close to God such that he will stop sinning in the power provided, by, provided to him by God. No glory accrues to the sinner, but all glory accrues to Jesus. When there's an overcoming experience in your life, it's not a glory to you. It's a glory to him. It's his doing. It's his power. It's his strength. It's his desire for you and I to be overcomers. But he's the one that it causes us to be overcomers. So what then can we make of the notion in, uh, in our book, God's Character in the Last Generation? What can we then make of the notion that our tainted nature needs continual forgiveness? Well, we make a distinction between evil and guilt. A distinction between evil and guilt. Trees and animals display distortion caused by the effects of sin in the world. But they have no capacity to choose. They're not condemned by God. And so we have, uh, when we think about things that are evil in the world, there's no choices to be made. But when there are moral choices to be made, then you have guilt. And so you and I, you know, let's say you're uh, differentiating between yourself and a rock. A rock can't make choices. You can make choices. 
So guilt would be the category potentially that applies to us. Evil in the world, if God needs to change the rock, then that's, that's that category. The atonement deals with guilt by forgiving, and it, de and it deals with evil results by recreating and restoring what the curse of sin has damaged. So it's a category error to teach that even when we are not willfully sinning, our human nature itself needs forgiveness. That's a category error. Your nature doesn't need forgiveness. When does condemnation arise? Condemnation arises from intentional, morally wrong personal choices, not from the human, human organism into which one is born. Our best deeds do not need forgiveness. They need healing. Forgiveness is for acts of sin. The atonement does not apply forgiveness to situational aspects of our lives to which we're subjected apart from our choice. So are we born with a sinful nature? Yes. Do we experience infirmities like faulty memory and the making of unintentional misjudgments? Yes. Are we guilty when we drink tainted water or we're unintentionally exposed to carcinogens? Are we guilty for that? Or what about the gospel workers responding to God's call who intentionally leave the relatively clean air of the West in order to go and labor for souls while, while uh, breathing the severely polluted air, air in the Orient? What about them? Do they need to pray every day for forgiveness for breathing the air where God has sent them to work? To compare God's infinite perfection to our human imperfection and to say that anything less than our making decisions as infinitely perfect as God is, is sin, is to create a philosophical trap. Such a teaching leaves all of our obedience tainted by sin in some respect, and it introduces a hopeless fatalism into the Christian experience. You can never overcome. Even when you come to church on the Sabbath, and you're keeping the Sabbath, you can't be keeping the Sabbath, you're still sinning because you're breathing, you're existing, your heart's beating. That's not what the Bible teaches. There's a difference between temptation and sin. And as soon as that gets blurred, you get into an evangelical gospel, you get into lots of problems. And the sanctuary system, by the way, won't work with that. And then you have to take away the sanctuary understanding. And then pretty soon you have to take away this piece and take away this piece and take away this piece. And brothers, one day, and sisters, one day, uh, we would just just move in with the next evangelical church down the street because there'd be nothing at all different about us. And the worst piece of all would be that we would not even believe that victory over sin was a possibility. What a tragedy to think that the planet would think that there's a God, but he won't give us victory over sin today. What a tragedy that would be. God's character in the last generation readily expresses the opinion that last generation theology produces guilt and hopelessness and despair. I guess I just disagree. I believe the reverse is the case. It is actually the powerless, hopeless, victoryless, spiritually empty, non-Adventist, non-biblical, non-sanctuary informed viewpoint that increases guilt and despair. We get to choose. Will we follow what the Bible says? Or will we follow this convoluted theological system that we keep absorbing in from, from other places? Ellen White is not trapped in the 1580 Book of Concord Lutheran Salvation Understanding. And there's some pretty interesting things in that. But you know that uh, Luther, uh, Luther died, I believe it was 1545. By 1578 or 79, you have the, the uh, formula of Concord, and then you have the book of Concord. You see the cover of it there in 1580. And Martin Chemnitz, Chemnitz the second Martin, he was the systematizer of that. And uh, within 40 years of Luther's death, just about, Lutheranism looked totally different than it did while Luther was alive. So we've got to be careful about what Luther says versus what Lutheranism became. In one generation, I might add. Interesting. P. 
pieces all around. By the way, the next slide shows you, uh, and I know you can't read it, but this is a uh, uh, index page from the Book of Concord, and if you look at it, you will see, uh, you, if, you could, if you could see that well, uh, you'd see that the very first uh, item on the left column on the page uh, is original sin. It's the first thing on the doctrinal list, original sin, if we go on to that item. Ellen White doesn't portray believers as being in the, at the same time saints and sinners like Luther does. She doesn't speak of our best deeds needing forgiveness. For our, our actions to be of value to God, by the way, in the Selected Messages statement, doesn't necessarily mean that they have saving merit. All merit for our salvation comes from Jesus' life and death for us. The basis for our being saved is never, never, even, even in the remotest sense, located in ourselves. The corrupt channels of humanity are not stronger, however, than Jesus, the divine high priest of humanity. Jesus is stronger. First Selected Messages 341, paragraph 2, it says that Christ goes on to say, Christ was hanged upon the cross that he might be able to impart his righteousness to fallen sinful man and thus present men to his Father in his righteous character. I believe that uh, that statement, uh, that paragraph, the, the 18 paragraphs of the corrupt channel statement, so-called, have a, has a lot of insight to us that gives us a lot of hope rather than sadness and despair. Well, one of the things that we saw there was over and over again the idea of being a partaker of the divine nature. So would you turn and open your Bible over to Second Peter? And I'd like to spend the last portion of uh, my time on this presentation with you looking a little bit at this idea of becoming a partaker of the divine nature. So we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 2 through 11. Now we rejoice in verses 2 through 4, and so let's read that out. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. And now it doesn't stop there, but what else does it say? Having escaped, interesting, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Through Jesus, you see, we are given great promises, and through these promises, we are made partakers of the divine nature. But exactly how is it that the promises are made effectual in us? It's a good thing to ask and a good thing to try to understand. Do we experience the power without acting out our faith? Well, let's just read straight on, because do you know uh, the Protestant principle? Scripture interprets Scripture. And Peter's pretty good at interpreting what Peter has to say. Paul's pretty good at interpreting what Paul has to say. Well, what does Peter say as he goes on? Could he possibly suggest that there's a way for humanity and divinity to work together? Well, let's read, uh, first, well, let's read verses 5 through 11 now. But also for this very reason... Now, what reason? The reason we just talked about, that through these promises we might be partakers of the divine nature. For this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Listen, don't stop. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent 
to make your call and election sure that for you, for if you do these things, you will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Doesn't that give you hope? When you read that, how can you do anything but say, I want that, I want to become a Christian, I want that to be my experience. So how is virtue added to faith? How is knowledge added to virtue? How is self-control added to knowledge? Well, the text told us. We were told by giving our giving all diligence, which is what Paul said in Philippians, right? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who works in you to will and to do. He says, giving all diligence, and by determination, it says in the same passage, to do these things. A Christianity that doesn't do anything isn't Christianity. The strength is from God. Even the ability to use the will by which we choose God, even, even it is a gift from God. Nevertheless, we are to think, we are to do, and we've all read this insight, Steps to Christ 47. Everything depends on the right action of the will, the power of choice God has given to men. It is theirs to exercise. God gave it to you as a gift. It's yours. Desire of Ages 125. The tempter can never compel us to do evil. He cannot control minds unless they are yielded to his control saying the same thing but a different way. And so, and so in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, Paul tells us something. He says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. This is God's will. This is what he desires. When the human and the divine are combined, we're not left with to the emptiness and the powerlessness of our own nature. Our natural heart is not left unsubdued. Rather, the Holy Spirit works in us. We live in communion with Jesus. We have the mind of Christ, our mind lifted up out of itself and charged with a heavenly current. Desire of Ages 363, if you don't believe me. In Christ, the cry of humanity reached the Father of infinite pity. As a man, he, Jesus, he supplicated the throne of God till his humanity was charged with a heavenly current that should connect humanity with divinity. Through continual communion, he received life from God that he might impart life to the world. And the last thing, the next thing it says is, his experience is to be ours. Top that. Top that. You can't top that. And so you see, God's divine power has given us all that we need to live Christian lives today. Oh, but the end times are going to be too hard. No, that's not, that's not what it says. His experience is to be ours. It's beautiful. When we're diligent in embracing the promises, when we're diligent in choosing to say, yes, Lord, work in me, change me, then it happens. All the pieces, faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and finally love authentic work in us. A heavenly current, continual communion, Charge our humanity so that we have the experience of Jesus, his experience is to be ours. It is hope that the Adventist message brings, not despair. It is hope. And by the way, the main Bible passages that I've referred to in this talk, Philippians 2, 12 and 13, 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4, some of those same passages are the passages that thrilled the hearts of A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, but do you know that certain Adventist historians of recent decades find these emphases concerning, very concerning to them. They look at themes preached by Jones and Wagner and they think that somehow an interest in Christ close at hand, Christ indwelling, the very experience which Paul calls Christ in you, the hope of glory. They think that that is uh, 
liable to lead us into pantheism. Did that, leave, did that lead uh, Paul into pantheism? Did that lead P Peter into pantheism? I don't want to go off my track here. But you know, the ideas of cooperating with God and being partaker of the divine nature, those are ideas that God has for us in these last days. And we need to watch closely where certain folks are connecting dots because sometimes their dots are wrong and sometimes their connecting lines are wrong. And sometimes they're wrong, the connecting dots and the connecting lines are wrong altogether. Well, let's conclude. Humanity and divinity combined is the experience of the gospel. Uh, this is what made me want to be, to accept Jesus as my Lord. This is the question upon which this whole symposium is founded. The question, what happens? What happens when a generation says yes to Jesus? The world wants to know what happens when that happens. What happens when we see beyond the ingenious, power-nullifying explanations that men have constructed? What happens when we lay that aside? And what happens when we follow what Jesus has given us in the Bible? God's character and the final generation meet together. And then Peter can conclude his epistle with the warning. 2 Peter 3, 11 in the first part of 12. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? When we know these things, we can agree with one who has said... To silence forever Satan's charges. To make it evident that his people are serving him from motives of loyalty and right without reference to reward. To clear his own name and character of the charges of injustice and arbitrariness. And to show to angels and to men that his law can be kept by the weakest of men under the most discouraging and untoward circumstances. God permits Satan in the last generation to try his people to the utmost. They will be threatened, tortured, persecuted. They will stand face to face with the issuance of the decree to worship the beast in his image, Revelation 13, 15. But they will not yield. They are willing to die rather than sin. That was M. Alan Dreesen in the Sanctuary Service, page 317. Willing to die rather than sin. Do you know that's where Jesus was? Right? On the cross, Jesus was willing to die rather than to sin. And now it remains for us to be joined with him in his crucifixion. Romans 6, 6 says that, right? That we are buried with him in baptism and raised with him in newness of life. Humanity and divinity combined are willing to die rather than sin. You see, that is God's character. And that leaves me with just this five-word question in conclusion, a challenge. Are we the final generation We'll decide.